This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Roger McOwen, K-State and Washburn Law Professor, begins today's show by reminding people of the rules and regulations that are involved with prescribed burning in Kansas. Keeping the show rolling is Butler County Extension Agriculture Agent Charlene Miller as she discusses her recommendations for halter-breaking cattle and getting them prepared for showing. The show concludes today with Key State's Brad White, Bob Larson, Philip Lancaster, Brian Lubers, and Select Sire's Adrian Lule on another part of the Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat podcast as they talk about the use of sex semen in commercial beef producers' artificial insemination programs. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Wednesday show with an agricultural law update with K-State and Washburn law professor Roger McOwen. Roger, thanks for joining us today. Good to be with you, Shelby. Roger, today talking about prescribed fire in Kansas and some of its rules and regulations. Prescribed burning, first of all, is, is pretty critical to agriculture, and it's a, it's a key component of rangeland management. And, of course, we have experts at K-State that uh, deal with rangeland management. But then uh, when rangeland management issues go awry, then they get to talk to people like myself. And, and we get into issues concerning prescribed burning, which is a big issue in the Flint Hills, particularly in the month of April. But uh, it's already started in some areas. And it also helps us limit wildfire risk, let alone manage the rangeland itself. So it's a big issue, but all of the states in the Great Plains, including Kansas, have regulations that specify how an open burn of agricultural land is to be conducted. When people come out to say no burn ban, does that always apply to agricultural prescribed fire? No, there's a major exception for agriculture. Now, in general, there's a burn ban, but agricultural activities are constitute a major exception to that general rule. And so when people are working on going to get that prescribed fire and start off burning, are there a few people they need to notify before doing so? Generally, yes, and particularly if wind conditions might result in smoke blowing toward a public roadway, then you have to give notice to such entities as the highway patrol, if it involves a a state highway, local people such as a county sheriff or local traffic officials, if we're dealing with local issues and we don't have a state highway or an interstate that's involved. And we need to contact them before the burn is started, and that's in the administrative regulations uh, that govern open burning of prescribed agricultural lands in Kansas, you can't create a visibility safety hazard. That's the basic rule. But we also can't control the wind. And sometimes the wind will shift after a burn has been started. So that's why these notice requirements are in the rules. And use common sense. You can't burn uh, in an area that would obstruct air traffic, for example. So there's a reg that applies with respect to burning near an airport. Then if you could uh, create a potential hazard for air traffic, then you're going to have to notify airport officials before the burn begins. So again, just kind of use common sense. Who should I be notifying in these instances that I am going to conduct a burn? But you have the right to conduct the burn. And are there some rules and regulations around what conditions people should be burning in and what time of day? There are. Um, you Obviously, you don't want to start a fire close to um, evening hours, so you, and you need to have it extinguished or controlled. Uh, and there are rules with respect to what control means. And the burn has to be supervised until it's extinguished. And there are specific regulations on all of that. The burn regulations also allow local jurisdictions to adopt more restrictive ordinances or resolutions that govern prescribed burns of agricultural land. So you always want to be familiar not only with what the state regulations are, but to see if your local government and local officials have enacted different rules or more stringent rules than what the state regulations say. So you always want to be familiar with those too. And as we're getting close to April and thinking about some more rules and regulations that could be taking place, there are some counties in Kansas where certain burning is prohibited. There are, but again, there are exceptions during the month of April in these counties. But in the counties of Butler, Chase, Chautauqua, Cali, Elk, Geary, Greenwood, Johnson, Lyon, Marion, Morris, Pottawatomi, Riley, Sedgwick, Wabunsee, and Wyandotte counties, then the regs say in those counties, and those are going to be your Flint Hill counties largely, that the open burning of vegetation and wood waste and structures or any 
other material on any premises during the month of April is prohibited. But obviously we say, well, how can you say that? Because we always burn the Flint Hills in April. Well, there's a major exception to the regulations on that. Prescribed burning of agricultural land for the purpose of range or pasture management, as well as the burning of CRP land that is conducted in accordance with the requirements for a prescribed burn of agricultural land is permitted during the month of April in these Flint Hill counties. What about for those who are wanting to do non-agricultural open burning activities? Well, they also have to meet certain requirements, including a showing that open burning is necessary and it's in the public interest and it's not otherwise prohibited by public government or local government or any fire authority. So again, the answer is they can do it, but make sure that they're in tune with the governing regulations that apply in that particular situation. Wanting to talk about a few different legal things that could be involved with prescribed fire, and the first one being negligence. Well, that is the rule in Kansas. Uh, The courts have said that farmers have a right to conduct agricultural burns, and um, it's not a strict liability approach, so it's a negligence approach. And what that means is that uh, it's based on the facts and circumstances as to how I conducted the burn, and of course, was I following all of the regulations that were in place? And if I wasn't, then that would be evidence of negligence in conducting the burn if somebody is harmed by what I've done. If I cause an injury or an accident to occur, or I burn somebody else's property that gets away from me, those types of things. Well, I'm only liable under the theory of negligence. They have to prove somehow that I was negligent in conducting the burn. And one way that they can establish that is I didn't follow the rules. I didn't notify authorities that needed to be notified. I didn't have uh, the fire under control. I didn't monitor it until it was extinguished, so forth and so on. That would all be evidence of negligence. So it's a reasonability standard, and these cases get tried to juries. And so you don't want to get to a jury because if they don't like you, uh, that's just kind of the way it goes. You may get a negative verdict from the jury and then have to go on to appeal. But um, the way it's conducted is what we look at in these types of situations to determine if there was negligence. You wrote a blog article about this, and within there, there's an example. And would you mind sharing that with our listeners? Yeah, and the the example basically is let's assume that we've got a rancher in Kansas that's followed all of the rules to prepare for and conduct a prescribed pasture burn. But after conducting the burn, the rancher banks the fire up and leaves it in what he thinks is a reasonably safe condition before heading to the house, say, for lunch. And over lunch, the wind picks up and spreads the fire to an adjoining tract. Well, if the burning of the neighbor's property wasn't reasonably foreseeable, then they can't sue that rancher for negligence. They can sue, but it's likely not going to be successful. But if the wind was at a high velocity before lunch and all the adjoining property was extremely dry, it probably was foreseeable in that instance that the fire would escape and burning uh, burn a neighboring landowner's track. So foreseeability, again, depends on the facts. Uh, and was it reasonably foreseeable? And so there are lots of cases on the issue of reasonable foreseeability in general. A lot of There's a couple of famous cases on it, not so much with respect to pasture burning, but the same principle applies. And again, use common sense. If you bank up the fire before noon and head to the house to have lunch, what were your weather conditions when that happened? If you did it when it was windy and you knew that, that's going to be a problem. If If the weather conditions look like, hey, everything's under control, I can take a break for a bit, uh, that's probably not negligent. So it's very highly fact dependent. And some other things to think about when it comes to prescribed fire and legal liability, intentional interference with real property. Well, that is another legal principle that can apply in open burning activities. And it's closely related to the issue of trespass. So if I'm intentionally interfering with my neighbor's property, then I'm basically trespassing against them. And that's the unauthorized or unlawful entry upon somebody else's land that interferes with their exclusive possession and ownership of that land. So at its most basic level, it's it's something I'm doing to my neighbor's property that I don't have their consent to do. Well, we get into this with respect to drift issues. And there are some cases that are that are out there where a fire was lit and they knew that it, the wind was going to carry it directly to that person's home. 
And uh, it created such a mess that the court said, well, that was an intentional trespass. So the court didn't use the negligence standard in that one. They used a trespass standard because of the facts. So uh, that's not a Kansas case. What I'm referring to that is an Oregon case where in eastern Oregon they do burn in the Palouse area. So that's another principle that's there. But strict liability rules do not apply in Kansas. Um, What I mean by that is we don't care if you're negligent or not. If you did a pasture burn and you cause problems, then you're responsible. That is not the rule in Kansas whatsoever. What is the rule in Kansas for prescribed burning? It's a negligence rule in Kansas. Uh, Farmers and ranchers in Kansas have the right to set a controlled fire on their property for ag purposes, and they're not going to be liable for damages resulting from the fire if it is set and managed with ordinary care and prudence depending on the conditions present. And that is Kansas case law on that. We had a prominent Kansas case in 1996 that set forth that standard. So at least at the present time, and that's held for almost 30 years, and the longer a court opinion hangs out there, the tougher it is to have that reverse. So that's pretty solid law in Kansas. Kansas, but still at the present time, the courts have determined that there is no compelling argument for imposing strict liability on a property owner for damages that result from a prescribed burn of agricultural land. And that's the key take home point. And while we are talking about Kansas, are there similar rules for our neighbors to the south? The liability rule that I just mentioned also applies in Texas and Oklahoma. It's a negligence rule. It's not strict liability. So again, carefully following prescribed burning regulations is going to go a long way in defeating a lawsuit claiming that the damages from your prescribed burn were the result of negligence. Just make sure you know what the rules are. Follow what those rules are. Check your local rules and see if they're more stringent than the state regulations on that, and you you should be in good shape. Roger, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some rules and regulations when it comes to Kansas prescribed burning. Thanks for having me. That was K-State and Washburn Law Professor Roger McOwen. I will link a blog article in today's show notes if you'd like to read more on this topic. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our show talking about getting livestock broke to lead. And then to talk about it, we're joined by Butler County Extension Agriculture Agent Charlene Miller. Charlene, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Shelby. And so, Charlene, as we're talking about halter breaking livestock, are there things that people should maybe do before they even attempt to put on a halter? Absolutely, Shelby. One thing that um, I always tell people, a lot of times when calves come out of the pasture, they do not have that animal exposure, so they may be a little more edgy, and some of them tend to be a little more skittish than others, and so going out to feed them every day, twice a day, um, sit with, sit in the feed bunk, make them come up and eat the feed around you, walk slowly and calmly. Um, animals can sense your nervousness as well, and you may just be just as nervous about getting ready to halt or break your animal as your animals are to seeing a person with them. So spending time around the animals, remaining, um, I like to say the three C's, cool, calm, and collected, and how you handle your animals and how you approach them. Even those animals that tend to be just a little more skittish, they will come around. We tend to like those a little better because they usually halt or break a little bit quicker because they fight the halter so much faster. (laughs) But again, spending the time sitting in the feed bunk. So just being out there and spending that time with those animals um, before you start halter breaking can always be beneficial to helping start that trust building process. Charlene, as we're talking about getting livestock ready to lead and being your friend walking around different areas, first, thinking about safety and what are a few things that people should keep in mind? Things to think about on the safety side is, one, do you have the facilities, first off, to be able to contain your animals? You don't have to have the fanciest designs out there. You know, a good set of panels always work, too, as long as you have them secured. But you also need to keep in mind when it comes to halter breaking, are you breaking a small animal um, that's lightweight, either from a goat or a weaning calf that may be five, six hundred pounds up to not thinking about halter breaking them till it's about county fair time and they're weighing up there a thousand plus pounds. So some th- safety features to think about there. And wanting to maybe those thousand pound animals not be by yourself trying to halter break them. 
Absolutely. Anytime that you're out halter breaking something, I think especially as a youth, it's great to have a second person there because Murphy's Law does exist. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when something will happen. So always having a backup person to help you out. Halter breaking cattle, sheep, any species, how do we get started? When getting started halter breaking, you need to make sure you have the right equipment first. A halter um, is a necessity when halter breaking, and I like to think of the right halter using Halters that are not designed for use on cattle do not always work the best or get get you the biggest gain when it comes to halter breaking. Typically, um, our process at home is we put a halter on them and let them drag it for three days. And then on day four, we tie that animal up. And we always have a second person there with us to help because they do like to be a little bit ornery. When you first tie them up, they're going to fight that halter a little bit, but we stay with it. And we leave them tied for a couple hours while we're out there. We introduce them to the livestock blower, the comb, anything we can that first day because their head's already going to be a little sore from starting that halter breaking process and dragging that halter. So the sore they are, the less they tend to fight, at least in our experience. And so just staying consistent with that process. And once we get going, it is an everyday routine working with those animals. So we catch them every day for a week and tie them up. And it's the same thing of combing, brushing, working with them to walk, just spending a lot of time. Habits are not gained in a one-time experience. It takes a lot of time and a lot of hours to do it successfully and gain that trust of the animal and that animal to gain the trust of you. So making the point of you're not only catching them, but you're touching them as well. Absolutely. And some calves tend to kick more than others. And so just using that, um, knowing your flight zones and how to approach the animal safely is very important. Once someone does have them caught and hopefully calm down a little bit, how do you go about actually getting them to walk for you then? Sometimes you have to be as stubborn as the animals are and persistent. We use a little link. There's some halters that are designed that have like a metal clip between the loop of the halter and the actual lead that puts a little bit more pressure on their chin. We have found those to be more successful in ours just because it makes them a little sore when they go to start the halter breaking process. And one push, one person, maybe that's a little stronger on the front end doing the pull-in. And if they're not wanting to walk for you, somebody behind helping push or twist their tail a little bit to start that process. And then also rewarding them. So when they do start to walk, let up on that lead just a little bit, reward them. We stop, scratch them as a recognition as well. And what if they just really, really, really do not want to walk for you, Charlene? Stay persistent. Persistence is the key. They will eventually give in. We've had some very stubborn ones. Um, We've used a rattle paddle behind them before, not on them, um, but we have shaken it behind them or tapped the ground behind them, and that would get them to go Absolutely do not use a tractor, four-wheeler, anything else like that. That's considered animal abuse. But just staying persistent in pulling, pushing, and working with them every day, and they will learn the steps to succeeding in walking. How do you go about getting that animal ready for all the different sounds they might hear at a show, especially because they might not be hearing them on a daily basis? We spend a lot of time desensitizing our animals because whether it's county fair, whether it's a spring show you're going to, there's always going to be kids running around, um, things flapping that they're not used to, a coat laid across the gate. Um, They may not like flappy items in their face. So we do jumping jacks, arm kicks, leg kicks. Once we get them halter broke, we rattle feed sacks around them. When we break them to a livestock blower, we take the hose across their back, across their legs, gently, of course, not with any force or anything, and just spend time exposing them to all of those different elements to get them used to potential any activity before going out to whether it's spring show or a cattle show. And I always say that, you know, exposure is also one of the best methods to learning desensitization. And so if you can get out and go to spring shows before a county fair, it's a great opportunity to get those animals exposed to all the different things in their environment. And just like they gain trust with you, you know, they gain trust with other things around the more times that you can desensitize them or expose them to those different elements. And Charlene, as we're thinking about going to a show, a lot of times those animals are drinking out of a bucket while at home, maybe a bigger tank. So do they need to get exposed to that before they go? Absolutely. 
the show environment is so much different than the home environment and creates stresses on the animals. So whether um, they've never been hauled in a trailer um, or in our instance, we are on well water. We don't have rural water or city water. So when we go to shows, the chlorine for the animals tends to affect their desire to drink or feel like we would want them to. And used to drinking out of a tank versus a bucket. So exposing that to them ahead of time. Sometimes you can try different electrolytes. There's a variety of them out there that you can put in buckets of water ahead of time to get cattle used to those flavors as well. Prior to going to a show, introducing them to new things at a show is going to just add more stress to them. So anything you can do to alleviate some of those stresses um, ahead of time is definitely a win-win for both you and the animal. Charlene, then how do you recommend a showman getting their animal comfortable with standing for long periods of time, which might be required at a show? We do um, train our animals to stand for a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours at night. Now, I know during the school year that gets to be a little bit challenging when there's sports and athletics, other things going on. But definitely through the summer, taking those animals, tying them up, working with them, staying out there with them while they're tied up. So they get used to having to stand with their head up. And then we usually let them loose back in the pen um, under fans in the afternoon during the summer months. And what about exposing them to the show equipment, which is sometimes a little bit different than that at-home halter? Absolutely. We uh, no different than the halter breaking process, time and consistency. It's the same way when you're teaching your animals to show. So with the show halter, not putting it on before the show is not the best decision. Animals react differently to chains around their chin um, if they've never had one. So put that show halter on at home, practice showing them, expose them to that show stick, All of those different elements, the more you can do ahead of time and train them to, the more successful your show experience will be for both you and the animal. And always wanting to mention that if you're not comfortable doing this and need some help, more than likely there's some 4-Hers or 4-H volunteers that would be happy to do so. Oh, absolutely. There is a wealth of knowledge across the state of Kansas when it comes to youth livestock um, skill sets, who's available to help, whether it's 4-Hers or other leaders. So if you do need help, look to those in your county or reach out to your county extension office. I promise you there will be people out there who are willing to step up and help you gain through that experience. Charlene, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some pointers for getting your cattle broke to lead. Thank you for having me, Shelby. I really appreciate it. If anybody has any questions or wants to visit with me about what works and what we have found to be successful, I'm more than happy to connect with you. I can be found at the Butler County Extension Office. That was Butler County Extension Agriculture Agent Charlene Miller. You can find her contact information on the Butler County K-State Research and Extension website, which you can find by going to butler.ksu.edu. Again, that is butler.ksu.edu, or I will also link it in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. I'm Jacob Clout in for Shelby Varner, and we end today's show with Brad White, Bob Larson, Adrian Lule, Ryan Lubers, and Philip Lancaster from the Beef Cattle Institute. For a commercial operation, is sex demon a viable technology, and where would I use it in a commercial beef cow-calf operation? And Adrian, I'll go to you first. So, um, yes, I think that it's becoming more affordable to use sex semen, and um, you do have to account for the fact that you breed slightly later. But if you are using heat detection aids, you can make that decision to use the sex semen on cows that are truly in heat to maybe sway, you know, the numbers of whether you want heifers for replacements, or maybe you just want more steers to fill out your load. And so if you can push your, um, ca- your calves to maybe 70% steers or, you know, bull calves, then all of a sudden that becomes viable when you start looking at being able to sell calves later on. So, um, I just think as it's become more common and, like I said, affordable, um, we're definitely going to see it used in commercial, not just purebred. Yeah, affordable and success has gone up. Originally, it was expensive, and the success was a fair bit different than than regular semen. 
Bob, right. go ahead. Yeah, I, I do think that there's an opportunity for commercial producers, but you do have to recognize that, that your cost per pregnancy does go up, uh, even compared to a um, classic artificial insemination. And so no, normally in a beef cattle herd, we're talking about a, a one-time synchronization at the beginning of the breeding season, then we'll be turning out with, with cleanup bulls the rest of the season. And my, my cost per pregnancy of that AI pregnancy is a little bit higher. But if I could select the types of replacement heifers that I really, really want, I think that's that's where I would start getting excited about it as a commercial producer, as to try to get all my replacement heifers out of that, or most of my replacement heifers out of that sex semen Picking the types of uh, dams and then breeding them to the the dams that I really want to to replicate, I, I get excited about having really high quality replacement heifers to bring into the the herd that have been genetically kind of chosen as well as managed in a way so that they are calving very very early. They're calving at the very first opportunity that, that they can in the breeding season. Well, and I think. You mentioned something there, Adrian, that kind of caught my attention. We always think about what Bob's talking about, of using female sex semen to breed cows, the right cows that I want to get replacements out of. But if I can use some male sex semen and shift my proportion of steers, um, even though I may have a lower pregnancy rate with that sex semen, if I can get a higher proportion of steers that are going to weigh more at weaning and bring more uh, per pound, that may pay off. And so that may be a, a good pencil to paper kind of exercise to sit down and see if that would pay off for the additional cost per pregnancy. You know, we, this might be the time in the overall cattle cycle. I'm going to go back to the heifer semen or female semen too, because we have a lot of people that are, that are trying to, trying to grow their herds up again. And so now might be a time where if you haven't really thought about sex semen, where it, yeah, maybe it could fit where it didn't even just a few years ago. Um, if you're if you're trying to trying to get your herd numbers back up and you're you're trying to tilt the odds in your favor of having more replacements quicker, that that might be a way to, to do it, a technology to consider. But again, and I'm I'm going to reiterate what Philip said. You know, you really kind of need to pencil some things out and see what's going to what's going to work better one one last thing that i want to say is you know the because we really haven't said it there's a group out there it's called the beef reproduction task force that i think has done really really good work they've got a good website they've got a lot of information they keep it updated um they, they're kind of my go-to i try to keep up on what what's going on but to make sure i'm keeping up uh, that's one of my go-to sites and um and i really encourage people to look at that as a as a resource, um, that's a group that's really done a good job trying to make this practical for beef producers. Yeah, Excellent. I'd like to I'd like to um, reiterate that too because they do update it every year. And the thing that I love about this industry is that all of the bull studs put that same estrus synchronization protocol that the um, task force puts out in the back of their catalogs. So it's very consistent, and that's what's going to make it really useful for for producers is to see that same thing over and over again. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. 